Assalamualaikum. Uh, good morning. Welcome back uh, to our program this morning, Community Builders Conference, uh, the flagship program under the GLOBS, Unlocking the Soul of Community Builders, Achieving Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this event is being organized together by IIUM and also Philandio, supported by United Nations, CSOS DG Alliance, and as well, all party parliamentary uh, group Malaysia APPGM. So I would like to invite all the viewers to like the page GLOPS and share the live uh, session to your friends and colleagues so that more can join in, uh, have a fruitful discussion, ask questions and uh, share their thoughts. Uh, this morning we have uh, three parliamentarian, uh, Malaysian parliamentarian, uh, Datuk Sri Hajah Rohani Binti Abdul, Abdul Karim. Welcome Datuk. YB, how are you? The second one is uh, YB Maria Chin Abdullah, uh, Member of Parliament of Petaling Jaya. Welcome, YB. How are you? Good. I couldn't hear your voice. Audio, audio. Okay. Yeah, salam alaikum. Thank you for inviting All right. me. All right, thank you. And the uh, third uh, uh, panelist is YB Dr. Kelvin. He's a young uh, parliamentarian from Kuching, Sarawak. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Not so young. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, right, today we're going to talk about sustaining impact via collective participation beyond politics. Of course, uh, even our panelists are now uh, live from the parliament itself, having the session uh, debating on the budget 2021. So I would like to start with Dato uh, Sri Haja Rohani. Uh, First, uh, I think many uh, of the participants would like to know what is actually all party parliamentary group Malaysia and what are their roles because uh, among uh, foundation, non-profits, all these uh, community builders are uh, looking forward from the leaders and from the parliamentarians how to navigate uh, sustainable development goals in Malaysia. So I'll give the floor to Dato uh, Sri Hajar Rohani. Welcome. Okay, thank you uh, Azlan. Now, um, well, actually, I am pretty new compared to the two, the two young guys there with me, but I'll start it off. <laughs> now, um, YB Maria and YB Kelvin can, can tambah later on. Now, Parliament Malaysia approved the formation of an all-party parliamentary group Malaysia, APPGM, on October 17, 2020 which is a bipartisan multi-stakeholder group of members of parliament, civil society, academia, public and private sector members. Now, on, on, on the same day, parliament approved the establishment of the first APPGM group on sustainable development goals with the Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance as the secretariat. Now, uh, the APP... GM SDG committee was established by members of parliament from both houses. That is the lower house, the one right here, and upper house, that is the Senate. And currently I'm the chair and my deputy is YB Maria Chin Abdullah and uh, YB Kevin there is our treasurer. Very important, no? he takes care of the money. <laughs> the committee agreed to undertake a pilot project in 10 parliamentary constituencies in seven states with the theme of localizing SDGs. Now, the 2020 budget allocated $2 million for this purpose. Now, all this, because we are all made up of parliamentarians, Aslan, so the secretariat uh, is made up of representatives from CSOs who serve as lead coordinators, academia from public universities and think tank groups who are assisting in the research and policy work, as well as CSOs and social enterprises who are undertaking the solution projects at the ground level. So first we plan and we go down, you know, so it's, it's, it's very thorough. And the SDG team is highly motivated and work in close partnership with the office staff of the MPs as well as with all the key district level government staff in localizing the SDGs. Now the pilot phase is being undertaken over 15 months between January 2020 and March 2021. 
there are four phases in this implementation. So phase one is the mapping and awareness. And a three-day field study is undertaken in each of the 10 constituencies during which time local issues and needs are identified. So this is, this is roughly uh, our APPGM SDG formation. And then uh, I think the pilot projects are being implemented now uh, under 22 capacity building programs and 32 solution projects in 10 parliamentary constituencies. I think it's on the screen, yeah, Aslan? Yes, yes. Now, these are, all, these are all short term capacity building and solution projects. And, and each project is about uh, roughly 128,000 ringgit. Now, the significant, it is, it is significant to note here that these solution projects were decided on a decentralized way. You know, we get opinion uh, and then we get, uh, we, they went down. But uh, Aslan, uh, we were hampered a little bit by the COVID, <laughs> you know, the coming of the, the, the COVID. So we are not able to really follow, if you see in the screen, we already line up the phase one to phase four. But right now we are at phase one, whereby um, we should be at phase three, right, Maria? We should be at phase three, but because of the COVID thing, uh, we, we, we are now at phase one, I think uh, going to phase two, right? Somehow phase two, but Kalau ikut the, the 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 schedule, we should be at phase three. But uh, I think it has to be, and and I think um, MOF has agreed right to 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 defer to defer um, um, the schedule because of COVID with uh, PKPB now many areas are having PKPB. So roughly that was what, as parliamentarians, this is what we are doing. And, um, and uh, if you were to see, these are niche themes in the constituency as Lan, if you see in the, in the video. Now Pendam, basically Pendam is, uh, Pendam is on land ownership and agriculture. Um, Lapas to uh, Jelly is smallholder dependency. Selayang is on migrant and refugees. Petaling Jaya is urban poverty uh, in urban area. Uh, we call it sustainable cities. In Bentong, sustainable agriculture in semi urban areas. Uh, Tanjong Piai, sustainable tourism in coastal area. Kuching uh, under Yambromat Kevin, squatters in urban areas. And then we have another one in Sarawak, Batang Sadong, connectivity in semi-rural area. And then we went all the way to Sabah, Papar, development impact on agricultural community, as well as in Pen Pensiangan, community development in rural and semi-rural areas. So it's a, it's, it's a wide stretch of, uh, of uh, projects undertaken. And in addition to solutions project, the, the secretariat members from various civil societies, public universities and think tank groups have also been providing policy input to the EPU, Economic Planning Unit as input to the 2021 budget, post-COVID National Economic Recovery Plan, the 12th Malaysia Plan, and enhancing the multi-dimensional poverty indicators, as well as effective district and local government level delivery of services, especially to bottom 40 and also the vulnerable communities. So Azlan, it's wide range. Here we are. <laughs> We can see how uh, it's covered both Nanjong and also Sabah Sarawak. Yes, all. Yeah, maybe I can get, I can get to YB Maria if uh, if we see from the planning itself, it it seems like there is a research is ongoing of uh, collecting data 
So how would this be uh, translated into an impact? I mean, is there any collaboration maybe through Belanjawan 2021 or through uh, Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama? Is this part of the project to sustain these communities uh, to, together with their niche areas of, of focus? Maybe, Maria. I think you need to unmute your audio. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. Can I just show you my uh, a few slides? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, we we are actually looking at um, the uh, sustainable development goals. Yeah, uh, to set our project, it is really uh, supplement to the present budget that we have for twenty twenty one. So if, um, say for example, my area, we started off with uh, poverty as what um, Dato has actually presented, uh, SDG 1 and also the sustainable cities. Uh, where, uh, why poverty is mainly, even though in a place like Petaling Jaya, we have, um, we have issues where we have pockets of poverty. And uh, this is the statistics that is presented by the, the department um of the overall uh, poverty in uh, malaysia um but uh, specifically i think that um, we need to uh, the budget should also reflect what is happening on the ground uh, particularly the unicef uh, report which actually um states that in kuala lumpur itself the ppr flats actually are becoming like ghettos uh, where they have uh, put in the uh, low-income households and most of them during this uh, crisis, yeah, the COVID crisis, 15% of the household actually uh, find that, you know, they are having problem trying to meet up with uh, sufficient food uh, for their families. And also one in two actually now uh, are act who are actually employed are actually not covered under the um, employment-based social protection. I know that the budget has uh, actually um, talked about withdrawing from EPF account one. Um, I'm not sure whether that is the best way to actually uh, resolve the um, income gap that is uh, faced by uh, the low-income um uh, communities um, in fact most of them don't even uh, have uh, EPF if you are talking about your Paniaga uh, on the streets and um, uh, small time contractors and all that they don't have the EPF so I'm, I'm not sure how that is going to help some of them uh, the other thing is really that uh, during this uh, COVID crisis about three in four uh, Malaysians actually find that you know it's very challenging to even uh, fork out 1,000 uh, ringgit in cash just to cover the um, the one week or two weeks of uh, e of uh, being confined to the uh, to the house. Um, the other one is really the employment, the earnings that um, that uh, UNICEF has found that one in four heads of household were actually unemployed during the MCO. And uh, if we look at the uh, um, people who are unemployed, one in three of the Malaysians actually find that, you know, um, they not only don't have enough money to cover the one week, but um, they are very stressed out. There's anxiety, depression, and also uh, facing stress. And most of, the t uh, most of these households are actually uh, female-hated households where um, they are living in the PPR and also the low-cost flats. So, so in, uh, particularly in Petaling Jaya, we also have, uh, have done our survey. The children, actually, uh, we found that 80% of the kids whom we actually survey in Lemba Subang 1, um, uh, they face underweight issue. 80% of the kids also face stunted growth. And 73% of the children actually are obese. Or based simply because they don't have enough money to buy food, so they buy the sugar water, um, you know, um, the very unhealthy foods just to keep um, their stomach filled up. So that is the situation. So I, I'm just really hoping that, you know, this present budget will actually really look into this. 
because uh, the social protection uh, that is offered um, doesn't cover quite a lot of the children who may not even go to schools because uh, given the situation where uh, schools are still not open, the uh, plan to actually give them the breakfast and um, uh, in the morning for the school children may not reach those who don't turn up in schools. So how do you cover yeah, in your social protection program, cover these children who are out of schools, uh, drop out and, um, and, and over uh, because of the COVID, they have actually lost interest in, in uh, going back to school. So I feel that, you know, um, there has to be greater emphasis yeah, on uh, increasing employment in Malaysia. And I want to really look at the local domestic uh, industries and give them much more support, much more, particularly our small, medium uh, enterprises. Uh, I feel that the budget has not actually uh, channeled enough in that area. The other one is really... Um, Guaranteed wage program in some countries, yeah, in Germany and so forth. Uh, in Germany, I, I, I think that they pay about 70% of the salaries um, just to ensure that, you know, uh, workers are kept uh, in their workplace. This is to also avoid companies shutting down because um, the prolonged um, from MCO to CMCO, it has really affected a lot of our workers and they have to stay employed. Otherwise, um, no matter how much we dish out uh, in terms of uh, cash, um, bantuan and so forth, it's not enough to resolve the problem. Um, the other one is really um, the quality uh, childcare and early education. Um, lots more money needs to be put into that area because we, we want to give uh, a bit more allowances for, to support the children. Um, the other one is really to uh, look at concentrated poverty. There are pockets of poverty. Uh, now they are actually getting bigger and bigger because of the crisis that we are facing, um, locate where they are and provide the resources. And it's not just about giving money and food. It is actually also the social spaces, um, the b ability to have better access to the resources, to transport schools and, and so forth. Um, these needs to be part and parcel of the social protection program. Um, the other one is really the immigration reform. We have a lot of uh, undocumented workers and uh, there have been many incidents, uh, unpleasant ones where they have been um, either sent back to their home or are in lockout. Uh, I, I think that they had, that kind of policy has to be re-evaluated because uh, the docu undocumented workers, whether you like it or not, they are still here in Malaysia and we need workers too as well. I'm not saying that, you know, um, giving them the priority, but um, they would be actually um, part of the supplement workforce that will help our economy to grow. So when I started uh, the project looking at um, SDG number one, no poverty, I find that, you know, um, it had to be related to all the many other issues like health, education, um, justice and also partnership uh, for to achieve the goals. So the SDG goals actually are interconnected and we can't look at uh, solving one issue and not think that it has no relationship with other issues as well. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, if you look at the Petaling Jaya uh, program, we actually had five, uh, the economic empowerment uh, for women at Desa Mentari, uh, where we were hoping that uh, from the soup, soup kitchen that they actually started off to help the, their neighbours uh, who just couldn't um, put food on the table, they are now being trained uh, under the uh, APPGM um, uh, support. They are now being trained to sell their food online. Um, <clears throat> and this is actually uh, giving them a wider option in terms of um, not going out to work, but still, you know, can still generate some income at home. 
The other project is really to look at the education because um, the Lamba Subang um, public housing that we have, a lot of students have actually uh, lost interest and dropped out from school. So a lot of NGOs are, are providing tuition classes and it's actually um, pulling all these NGOs who are providing the uh, tuition classes to uh, provide a much more holistic approach to teaching the students, motivating them and um, having some kind of social cohesion um, perspective being uh, implanted to uh, for these students. The other one that we are doing is um, <clears throat> on the empowering of the community because uh, APPGM is really a bottom-up approach. We want the community to take charge of their problem as well as work with the agencies, state agencies, local agencies, or even federal agencies to resolve the, the problem. So we are doing a cultural mapping with the community and after that, we will bring those um, uh, issues and also solutions to have a dialogue between uh, local and state agencies and together with the federal government uh, so that they they can uh, sit down together to actually resolve uh, the the problem themselves and uh, the other one the last one that uh, we are actually looking into um, is really about the documentation of the uh, COVID-19 challenges um, looking into health education and uh, poverty and how to be uh, how the communities can be better prepared. So I'm just hoping that, you know, this present uh, budget will really look at the, re-evaluate re the allocation that they have on the social protection and make sure that, you know, it really reaches to those who really need the support. Thank you very much. Thank you, YB Maria. I guess uh, from, uh... From the presentation given by Datuk Sri Haja, we can see the planning was in place even before COVID came. And then we see how the situation on the ground is worrying. I mean, a lot of development happens. So I would like to ask the YB, uh, Dr. Calvin, how does this situation, uh, I mean, affect the planning and, and also the, the, the framework of uh, the working framework on the ground that being uh, operated uh, under the APP uh, GM uh, Malaysia? Dr. YB. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to the moderator as well as my fellow uh, colleagues. I think uh, just now Dato uh, Rohani actually gave a very broad overview of what we are doing in terms of our intention and our vision for APPGM, especially in uh, localizing SDG principles. And it's only why B. Maria actually gave a very comprehensive uh, explanation in terms of poverty and empowerment. As you said just now, COVID-19 was, uh, of course, something unexpected for us. It actually shifted a lot of our uh, initial plans and helped us adapt to the need that actually COVID-19 actually exposed uh, inequities, inadequacies in our community. So as I said, uh, I've said this many times, COVID-19 is actually a stress test. Uh, and, this, and this stress test has exposed many gaps, inadequacies, not just in our economic system, um, our social protection system, but also in health. And this is where uh, some of the things that we want to address, especially some of the principles in the SDG uh, for, for well-being and health uh, uh, aligns to. So today, I just want to share a little bit uh, on, on some of my thoughts and some of the direction that at least on my side, uh, we are doing, especially on health impacts uh, on the poor, the B40, and why it is so important, especially now during this COVID-19 pandemic, to protect the most uh, vulnerable. Uh, as we know, as I said, COVID-19 is unprecedented. Uh, it has stretching consequences, uh, as, as Webby Maria mentioned just now, economic consequences, uh, health consequences, of course, political implications. And then uh, that is why um, uh, we can see examples. I mean, when, they, when, the, when the huge surge and during the third, third wave happened in Sabah, uh, actually at one time, uh, the certificate the statistics in Sabah showed that almost 43% of the patients that was warded uh, were very symptomatic. That means they were very sick and actually uh, there were really high, there were high death rates in Sabah, even among the young. 
So actually, somebody asked me uh, during that period, say, why is this happening? What's why Sabah suffering more, seems uh, to suffer more compared to the other states? And uh, for me, as I say, of course, this is multifactorial. Uh, but as again, it shows the inadequacies, the gaps within the healthcare system and shows a systemic neglect of the whole healthcare system and public health in general, where we'll see probably in general, there is a high level of malnutrition, uh, undernutrition, uh, which will of course affect the general immunity and well-being of um, this uh, community. So of course in Sabah, we see, as I said, we have to protect the vulnerable communities. In Sabah, we see many of these communities, the poor uh, people with uh, citizenship issues, stuff like that so we need to care for them because it affects us all so um one thing i want to share about health is uh when we talk about healthcare system uh it is not the same as health in itself uh healthcare system is about the hospitals the clinics the doctors the nurses the medical assistant the radiologists uh, and, and so on and so forth but when you talk about health uh it's about factors around that is determining the general uh, well-being of a person. Basic necessities, food, uh, clean water, uh, clean environment, all these affects the health of the person. And actually, uh, the biggest impact on health is actually poverty. So that is why YB Maria just now brought up a very good point in terms of why addressing poverty is so important. Uh, because in general, um, the poor, um, they have less or little understanding of the implications of, I mean, diseases, health, sanitation, or even in this, in this day and age, the severity of COVID-19. So if we do not protect, and I stress this, if we do not protect our most vulnerable, uh, it will affect us all. Just look at the example of Sabah, where they started, started the prisons, the most vulnerable, it started among the poor. And if we just leave them, it will just spread. And now because of uh, what happened there, we have a whole CMCO almost throughout the whole country. Um, some, some places even in Penang and Kedah, it break out in the prison. And then uh, because of that, it has uh, crazy effects all around uh, uh, the country. So actually yesterday, just last night, I was sharing in a forum on the healthcare budget and uh, what I hope to see in the future in terms of the direction that our country is going to take. Uh, so I, I, I really believe in this. I say that addressing health uh, is not just about allocations to the healthcare budget, but really, really addressing uh, poverty and uh, uh, infrastructure developments, especially uh, bam, um, uh, so, uh, basic necessities and stuff like that. So, so why then, then in that sense, how do we translate all these principles into what we are doing on the ground? How do we localize all these efforts and the values of SDGs on the ground? So I just want to share with you my personal experience in my constituency. So in Banda Kuching, the SDGs or the APPGMs, are, we are, uh, what we are doing is we are, we are what we call slum incubators. That means we are trying to uplift uh, the quality of life among those residents in the slums, especially in urban, uh, in um, those suffering from urban poverty. So the example I'm going to give is uh, is some work that we are doing in a kampong in a place called Kampong Changwan Pendam. Pendam is an Iban word which actually means graveyard. So it literally means that the squatters are living at the graveyard itself. So the joke is that once they live there, the conditions are so bad they don't have proper basic amenities, and if they die, they just move next door. So, uh, so Fair there enough. are sorry so. So there are three main pillars that we are, uh, we are targeting. Of course, one is the economy when we address uh, jobs, reskilling, upskilling of these people that lost jobs during COVID-19. Number two is, of course, healthcare, which I'll elaborate later. And three is education uh, for their children. So, I mean, in terms of healthcare, what we did was uh, we know we're in COVID-19 now. And a lot of these poor people, sometimes we just forget they are this, they are this in this corner of the city. Uh, with big beautiful houses surrounding but we just forget this whole community but in fact uh, many of them because of their living conditions because of their hygiene sanitation and the condensed density that they live in there's a high risk groups to spread uh, especially infectious disease one of the things that we wanted to go in was uh, to go in to educate them in terms of the importance of SOPs what COVID-19 means and, and all the precautions that's needed so I my, we, we purchased a uh, a mask for them as well, sanitizers uh, for adults and children. Some of them cannot afford to buy masks on a daily basis. Even their children is going to school nearby, they cannot afford to buy this mask. So we educate them on the on the techniques of wearing it, how to wear it properly, where to wear it, 
and very importantly, how to dispose it uh, properly. So uh, besides that, we also partner with uh, LPPKN, which is a government agency, um, to, to conduct a medical screening for the residents in that area. Uh, we did the general medical screening for NCDs, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, and uh, different issues like that uh, to make sure there is early intervention. We detect early, then we can make sure that they are uh, treated early. Uh, for the poor, most of the times they don't care about their, I mean, they don't really consider their health uh, until it's too late. And that's what we want to we want to change. We want to change the whole culture among them. And even for the women, uh, something we did it in October. So it was, October was a, a, a awareness month for, for women's health. So we made sure that there was a, even a pap smear and mammogram done for the women uh, in the in, in their squatter area. So there was this old lady, 70 year old, she was like, she was giving a pantun, a, a, a poem in Iban, because they are majority Iban, uh, so happy. They say, thank you for not forgetting us, even though we live in such conditions. So just seeing that just, just brought joy to my, eye, uh, to my heart. Um, we also did, uh, as I said, it's not just about health, but it's about other factors, environmental factors. So we did a Gotong Royong or community effort to clean up their whole environment. I mean, if you've been to a squatter area, one of the things you first notice is how dirty the area is. They throw rubbish under their house and stuff like that. So we started cleaning. We empowered them. We did not clean for them. We empowered the residents. We say, you know what? Uh, we, we are buying food. We have a kanduri after that. We have from makan together. But then let us work together. And we got everyone involved, even the children. I was so happy when I see children holding those long sticks, picking up trash among their friends and saying that, oh, I can pick up more than you. I can pick up more than you. So that we are making it like a game, uh, something fun for them to do. And while teaching them the importance of keeping their environment clean to, to destroy vectors such as mosquitoes, rodents, and stuff that brings uh, even uh, dangerous diseases. So, so again, as I said, if I had one wish how we can address health in, in our country, uh, it is to address poverty. So, so the best way, uh, and it's the cliche that we say, to address poverty is uh, education. So we wanted to make sure that the children uh, had education. I said, we've been doing MCO schools. We're leaving schools right now are closed in Kuching. And I'm very, very, very concerned for them because uh, the, the poor, they don't have proper internet service. They don't have gadgets uh, to, 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 to follow up with home-based learning. And if they, they don't go, I mean, they don't even have guidance from their family. I mean, you, they can give them an education package. If there is no guidance from the family, they, they cannot follow up. My concern, again, once they go back to schools, they'll be so left behind and they'll drop out. So the UN report in KL actually showed that many people are dropping out of schools because of this. And I believe it is the same uh, throughout the country and we need to address this. So actually we wanted to, we did, uh, we, we approached a, a, a nearby tuition center and said, you know, you know, we will provide the funds for you. Can you teach this group of children? There are 18 uh, primary school children and 19 secondary school children in that kampong. So I said, can you provide for the major subjects and we will handle the cost. So again, uh, as I said, uh, addressing health or poverty is a holistic things. There's many sectors to it. And then that's how we try to incorporate the SDG principles and, and localize it to their context and to their culture so that they themselves are empowered, they themselves buy in and they themselves are part of the whole program. So thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you, YB Dr. Kevin. That is something very deep in, in Kuching and somewhere else as well. Uh, Dato' Sri Haja, if we can see we are in, uh, in a very important moment now that Blanjawan 2021 is uh, seen as the most uh, important bullets to, to cope with this COVID and pandemic economy. So from the input, from the insights that uh, APPGM have already obtained from the ground, how uh, this, uh, this uh, data going to impact the parliamentarian across, uh, regardless from government or from opposition, in making decisions to craft out the best budget for the, for the people of Malaysia? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Azlan. Um, I, I think um, from the budget uh, presented by the Minister of Finance on the uh, on the sixth on the sixth of November, I think we we are very happy to note that APPGM we are getting a very good budget this time to continue our 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 work. So meaning to say, I think the government have seen that we are doing uh, a lot of good actually from this program. I think uh, and 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 I hope it, it, it will be there. Um, I think with 
YB Kevin here, YB Maria here will fight to make sure that 5 million, we, we get the 5 million. <laughs> uh, we get the 5 million. So it's a jump, you know, uh, Aslan, from 2 million in 2020 to 5 million. Because I think that they see they see some impact. Walaupun, even though, as I said, the projects just now was very much on schedule except for the COVID. But I think from what they have done is very good. And, and 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 for me, Azlan, this is my call. And I think it was mentioned yesterday in Parliament, yeah? I think YB Maria and YB Kevin, that we put aside politics, you know, when it comes to rakyat, we put aside. <laughs> I mean, we are all political creatures, but we put aside. When it comes, when it comes to voting next time, it's a different scenario altogether, Azlan. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to rakyat's needs, kesejahteraan rakyat. You see, just now when uh, YB Maria mentioned it, when YB Kevin mentioned it, these are very specific to our areas. Belum lagi masuk Batang Lupa. I think Kevin knows Batang Lupa is very far, you know, my Batang Lupa. But the people, they slog on, they go on. And as correctly mentioned, COVID, tak COVID, they have to go on, right? So that is why to them, it's, it's where to get the food on the table. So to me, this is this is this is my um, MP should put aside politics, work together, uh, because this is across all parties, and this is one of our effort of localizing SDGs. It's not a one-man show. It cannot be a one-man show. All the government agencies will have to come together. Information have to come. They have to give us the kind of data that we need. You know, when universities or CSOs that go down to conduct uh, the study to get exactly what is needed by the rakyat in the particular area. And MPs ourselves, we should have to delve into the spirit of SDGs. You know, when we talk about SDGs, it's not talking about politics anymore. It is putting, you know, put our heads together, propose and find the best way to help these people out. So I hope this is happening. And Webby Maria, Webby Kevin, we start with us. And when I see the projects that you all have done, because I came later, right, it's, it's great. And I think people are just waiting. Uh, and, and I think there are many more uh, NGOs, CSOs, that would like to partner with us the moment we show them what we have done. Azlan, can I show a little bit of video uh, what uh, what APPGM has been doing so that is it a very long the understanding video? is much better than the video. It's a two minute only, two minutes. Can uh, maybe at the end of the session, I mean, after I go to YB Maria and then. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, Aslan. Video. Okay, thank you, thank you. That would be great. Thank you, uh, Dato Sri. Yeah, yeah, thank YB you. YB Maria, uh, from what uh, uh, Dato Sri said just now, of course, uh, we want this budget to serve the people. So how would like you, from, from your data, from your engagement with the people, how NGOs, non-profits, all these uh, community builders can join in and, and accelerate the impact that we are trying to make at the ground? Bye, Maria. I think most important is really the consultation. Um, when this budget um, it was presented, I think there has to be that engagement also, not just with the politicians, yeah, um, but also with the NGOs. But uh, what I'm quite happy about in terms of the women is that uh, they recognize now that they need to put some budget on domestic violence, which is something that was very worrying during the um, um, movement control uh, order because uh, we, we have an NGO that reported that there were several hundred uh, cases. Yeah? But probably now there are, it's coming up to thousands. So uh, putting money there um, means that, you know, the government has actually had some kind of consultation with the NGOs. I think that should be the way to go. But I would like to see, as I have said just now, 
that the gov uh, that the um, budget actually concentrate more on giving employment because people need to work in order to put food on the table. Uh, otherwise, they will also not be able to take care of their health. You, you, if you get uh, COVID-19 uh, and all that, you want to do tests and all that, all that costs money. So if you don't have a job, um, that is not going to help. Uh, and particularly, our local industries, our local co uh, companies, our uh, contractors, our street uh, vendors and all that, they have to be supported. Mm -hmm. And they have to actually be part, made part and parcel as the target group for this budget. Uh, um, uh, and I think that there's not enough effort because if you look at uh, EPF and some of the tax incentive that are given, tax incentive, you are only targeting um, people who earn 3000 and above. What happens to those below? You, you talk about EPF withdrawal of 500 um, from account one, 500 from account two, but that is assuming that people have work or have a, even an EPF uh, account. A lot of these uh, um, lower end yeah, uh, occupations don't have EPF, don't have Percoso. So what is the support that uh, the government is going to give to them under the new budget? Um, that for me is worrying because uh, if we don't, our unemployment and poverty and we will run into a bigger bigger number uh, by the end of this year. Thank you, YB Maria. YB Dr. Kelvin, if we can focus some on the youth aspect, I mean um, those uh, graduates, those young people who are seeking jobs, uh, who are being uh, laid off, also, they want to serve the people. They, they are living in the neighborhood. They see uh, all these uh, troubled children just living in front of them. How, how can they contribute in this time? Uh, a very brief one. We are running out of time. YB, Dr. Silagan. Uh, when we say, uh, when we deal with COVID-19, we need a whole society approach. A lot of people say it as a, as a buzzword, but they don't fully understand it. When I say whole society, every single society, every single generation has to be part of it. And the young people uh, has a huge role to play, especially in helping their own communities. I'm going to give you a very good example. In Kampong Chawan Pandam, the one I told you just now, the main community builders and the people they were empowering are actually three young people which are university students or university graduates from that kampong itself. And they are the one coordinating. They are the one going house to house, uh, asking the aunties and uncles or the surveys and how, what are the programs that we can do. So you see, this is a good example of how uh, education can break cycle of poverty and those that obtain certain level of education can come back and help their own community. So I'm so happy to see these uh, young ladies. I call them the, the, the Power Rangers or the, the Super Girls uh, Wonder Women. <laughs> Um, so they are actually actively doing that. And all young people, as I said, whatever knowledge or whatever skills that you have in your hands, do not ever underestimate, uh, be underestimated just because you're young. There's so much you can do. And we have, we need a whole society for this COVID-19. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. We wish all the very best at the parliament. And I would, uh, as been promised to Dato Sri, I would like give the space as the closing video. And uh, with that, we will conclude the session. Thank you so much. See you. We're following uh, your debate and your discussion uh, through the live telecast from the parliament later. All the best. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. That was she can, that was she can, can, uh, can, can put for your, your video, video, I guess. I guess. <laughs> no sound. Dato Sri, you need to unmute from your device. I, I suppose. Ready, is it?
Tak ada sound. Dr. Sri, you couldn't find the source of the audio. See the pictures and imagine the music in our mind. <laughs> <I'll start laughs> Maybe this video is accessible through your Facebook page? Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. it is. We'll share that later, I guess. Yeah, share the link. Uh. Then maybe you get the music. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. So much. Bye. Take care. Bye. Yeah. All right, to all the viewers. All right, to all the viewers, we will be back, back very soon. Uh, we have uh, Dr. 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 Jason Surya and also Professor Dr. Dr. Rashila Ramli and also uh, Puan Nur Rahma Osman. Uh, we're going to talk about localizing SDG in the Malaysian uh, challenges and uh, Malaysian challenges and and hopes.